May 9th, 1969. Four short months after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., Officer Clemens appears on an episode, episode 1065 of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. The show opens as many other episodes do, yet with a noticeable difference. Instead of placing his iconic and dapper cardigan on, Mr. Rogers remarks about how hot the day is and how nice it would be if he were able to soak his feet into a small pool of water. He then proceeds to do just that, going outside, filling up a small pool full of water to soak his feet on his front lawn. At this point, Officer Clemens, an African-American, stops by to say hello as he is patrolling the neighborhood of make-believe. Mr. Rogers, being Mr. Rogers, offers the use of the pool to Officer Clemens. And at first, Officer Clemens is hesitant. Well, he says, no, that's OK. I'm doing things. And Mr. Rogers goads him a little bit. Well, soak your feet just for a little bit. And Officer Clemens responds, I don't even have a towel. And he says, that's OK. You can use my towel. Eventually, Officer Clemens rolls up his uniform pants, takes his shoes and his socks off, and shares the pool with Mr. Rogers. He even makes a remark that even a short rest can be beneficial. Seems odd, right? Seems almost strange. And yet this simple act was an act of defiance. We have to remember something important about this episode. The first and foremost is that it aired again very shortly after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., a quite prolific civil rights defender. It takes place, secondly, in 1969, where racial segregation was still going on. There were still whites-only water fountains, whites-only pools. In an act of innocent defiance, Mr. Rogers not only invites his fellow human being to share his pool, but also to use his own personal towel, something that would have made many people at the time incredibly uncomfortable. In subsequent interviews with Francois Clemens, the gentleman who played Officer Clemens, he remarked about how Fred Rogers thought it was one of the stupidest things in the world to keep people out of pools, especially on a hot summer day. Mr. Rogers knew precisely what he was doing. He knew exactly what he was doing. See, the problem was these supposed separate but equal things that were supposed to help end racial segregation actually furthered them because separate and equal never really meant separate and equal. They became systematic tools of oppression. It was separate and subpar. So when Mr. Rogers has the audacity to share his swimming pool with a person of color, an area of contention, and a tool used for segregation, people should have rightly sat up and taken notice. See, the whole thing has to deal with an issue of 1 16th of an inch. The part of the skin that holds pigmentation that protects the lower layers from harmful UV rays and other things is only 1 16th of an inch thick. Apparently, 1 16th of an inch is all it takes to make a person not a person. And to be honest, it blows my mind. 
I think the reason it blows my mind is because when we look at God's holy word, when we study the scripture, we have to come to one simple conclusion. And the conclusion is, simply put, that racism, hating people based on the color of their skin, based on where they are born, literally goes against God's plan for humanity. And yet it is something that happens every single day. Still today, in 2019, years and years removed from this innocent act of pool sharing, we do not still treat people as they are our neighbors. We have forgotten what Mr. Rogers has taught us. We have forgotten what God Almighty has taught us. And this act tarnishes the very image of God. To understand why this is such a big deal and how it is a slap in the face to God Almighty, we have to go clear back to the beginning. In Genesis, during the first account of creation, humanity is created on the sixth day. Human beings were said to be the last thing that was created. Because on the seventh day, as we know, God rests. And so on this sixth day, God does something different, something special. God creates humanity. God declares that humans will be made in our image. And I could possibly stop right there and be done, because again, using the text from the Bible, it literally proves my point. Well, not even my point. It proves God's point. Humanity was created in the image of God. There is no notion of color. There is no notion of where people are born. It simply says one thing, that humanity was created in God's image. Think about what that means for a moment. Human beings were literally created in the image of God. Now there's a lot of stuff that this can mean. And this is actually what peppers our ideas and our thoughts about what God looks like. Everyone wants to question what God looks like. I remember one time in camp we were asked to draw God. And most people, they did the thing where you draw a humanoid person, bald, long white hair, big flowing beard, wearing white robes. I drew mine without the head because I was thinking of that story with Moses, how we didn't see what God looked like. But what we know is that we are created somehow in God's image, literally giving us the duty to go out and be image bearers of God in the world. So every single person that you see, regardless of where they are from or what they look like, has been fearfully and wonderfully created in the image of an almighty, all-loving God. Think about that for a moment. I'm not talking about number of fingers, length of hair, questions about beards, or even questions about gender and race. Instead, what I'm talking about is that at some core level, every human being represents the image of God. Not only that, if you will notice in our text, God saw everything. This is verse 31 in Genesis 1. God saw everything he had in made. And indeed, it was very good. See, after God creates something, he always, God always would remark about how good it was. God creates. God says, this is good. Humanity was made the same way. Humanity is created. God looks upon God's creation and says, this is good. It looks nice. I, I did a good job on this. So it doesn't make sense then if we were created in God's image that people are hated, people are belittled 
because that image looks different than theirs. Makes absolutely no sense. Now this is where things get really interesting. If all of this is true, the idea of human beings being created in God's image and Jesus being God with us, because again, that's how we understand God is through Jesus. Literally, what we talk about when we talk about Jesus is what? Humanity confining the image of God, the all power and almighty of God, because Jesus has this sort of dual role, doesn't he? We profess that Jesus is both fully human and fully God. So if all of these things are true, the idea of human beings being created in God's image, the idea of Jesus being God with us, it then stands to reason that if God so loved humanity to put on the frail mortal trappings of humanity to be with us, to feel what we feel. If God did all of this, and if we were created in God's image, it therefore stands to reason that humanity in and of itself holds a special place in God's heart. Nowhere in the account of creation does it talk about what Adam and Eve looked like. We don't have records of what Jesus actually looked like. In fact, what's really fascinating is when we, most of the things that we think we know come from medieval paintings. And they were painting things as, well, they thought it looked like. For example, take a look at the Last Supper. It's weird how they're all wearing Italian-style clothes, isn't it? Sitting in an Italian-style room. And yet we know from the scriptures that that event didn't take place anywhere near Italy. So a lot of things that we think we know come from different popular cultures of the time. The authors of these texts didn't explicitly say, oh, Adam had brown hair and blue eyes or blonde hair or blue eyes or fair skin or dark skin. None of that mattered. Because that wasn't the point of the story. The point of the story is not about timetables, it's not about how people look, but instead to illustrate one simple fact that some way, somehow, God created humanity in God's own image. That's the important nugget here. We can quibble about other things later, but what is important, what is necessary to understand how we are to live our lives and why racism is so abhorrent to, it should be abhorrent to Christians. And the reason is because of this text. Because not only are we created in the image of God, but God declares this creation good. There's no modifications. There's no tweaks going on. We don't suddenly have wings. We don't suddenly have six fingers. God said, I did a pretty good job with this. And so when we defame other people based on something that God has preordained from the foundation of all of creation, what we are saying is, God, you don't know what you're doing. And that is an incredibly arrogant and dangerous place to be. Because we do not, cannot, and should not try to control God. And this, my neighbors, my friends, is why racism goes against God. Literally, a slap in the face to our Creator to say something that God created is less than good, is less than what it should be. God made human beings in God's image, and to deny someone rights or privileges based on how they look is literally to tell God that God's image is garbage. It's no good. It doesn't follow what we believe it should be for one reason or another. And this, friends, this is why racism is not only stupid, but incompatible with Christian teachings. 
And yet, when we look at the world, we still see the division. We still see people as being treated less than. We see systems in place to separate humanity from one another, denying the one thing, that one sixteenth of an inch is all it takes for us to say, you are not my neighbor. You have no value to me. Too often in this world, we do not view each other as our neighbor. And yet, when we go back to the Bible, when we look at the actual words of Christ, we see Jesus has words specifically for this. Our gospel reading today is one we all know. It's one that was taught, that we learned from being very small children, the story of the Good Samaritan. It's one of those things that when it comes up in the lectionary, it's like just God throwing a softball to preachers like, you got this. Because we all know this story. We know exactly what happens in this story. And it's an important and easy thing to preach on. But when you look at it, you can actually take it a whole bunch of different ways. But let's just look at it at face value and dig a little bit into the history of it. See, what we have in this story is a lawyer coming to Jesus. And we love lawyers, don't we? And, and they love lawyers in biblical stories, too. And, and we know this from uh, our, our lives today, that lawyers try to take things and see exactly what they say so that they can help people. And this lawyer comes to Jesus. Very simple question on the outside. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Basic question. What do I got to do? Jesus asks him, well, okay, well, you're a lawyer, you know laws, so you tell me what's written in the laws. And he gives the correct answer, the same answer that Jesus uses over and over again, which boils down to what? Love God, love your neighbor. And Jesus says, cool, you got it. You got it figured out. Good for you. And yet, the story does not end there. Because now the man wants to further justify himself. And who is my neighbor? He's like, I mean, let's draw a map here. You know, is it, is it you know, Tim and, and Betty down the street? Is it someone in, you know, on my street? Is it someone who lives in my community? Like, give me the actual definition of neighbor so that I know what exactly it is I'm supposed to do, because that's what human beings do all the time, right? They want to know exactly what it is they have to do. They want to justify themselves. And Jesus doesn't give them an answer. Instead, he just launches into this story, the story of the Good Samaritan. And we know this story. Man gets beaten up, left, for, left half dead in a ditch on the side of the road. And a priest comes by, and you think, okay, a priest, nice guy, you should know something about God. If this lawyer has it understood, you know, love, your, love God, love your neighbor, the priest obviously would know that too, right? And so the priest sees them, and the priest, wanting to follow the other rules, crosses the street. The priest goes on the other side and goes around, see, because the priest was not allowed to get another person's blood on them because then they would have been ritually unclean. Likewise, this is the same reason, the Levite, another holy person, someone who studied the laws, had the same laws as Jesus, would have come to the same conclusion, love God, love your neighbor, someone who would have known that or should have known that does the exact same thing because they were looking at the other law. So along comes a Samaritan. Now we have to take a step back and talk about Samaritans, because Samaritans are used a lot in the Bible. We've got to be very clear. We understand what the Samaritan was. Now basically, Samaritans were like Diet Coke, if you will. See, a long time ago, 
the, the Jewish people, they got taken away into captivity. A lot of them got taken away. And some of them didn't. They had to stay behind, but they weren't in Jerusalem. So they were in this other place in Samaria. And they started worshiping differently. They started doing things differently. And so after the exile is over, and after they're allowed to come back, all these Jewish people come back. They see these people, and they're like, wow, you're doing it wrong. That's kind of like what we do, but it's completely different. And so now there's this division based on religion and based on race because we're the people that came back here. And we know what we're supposed to do. And so if, if the Jewish people were like the Coca-Cola in this analogy, the Samaritans were like the Diet Coke. It's like, yeah, they, they, they say they're similar, but let's be honest, if you, you put a blindfold on and you take a sip of Coke and a sip of Diet Coke, you're going to know which one's which. But this Samaritan comes over, sees this person, and this person was on their way walking. Jesus is very clear. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, which means that this person is not a Samaritan. This person is an Israelite, one of the chosen people of God. Yet this Samaritan who would have no love for this person and this person who's lying there bleeding who would have no love for the Samaritan, they meet. And instead of saying, no, you're different than me, his heart is filled with compassion. Picks the man up, dresses his wounds, puts them on his animal and has to continue on foot while he takes this hurting man to an inn. Not only that, he stays there, he helps him, he gets up and leaves the next morning, pays for everything and says, I'll be back through. If he costs more money, let me know and I'll settle it then. Spending his own time, spending his own money, prolonging his trip versus doing what he needs to do. And he does this not because he has to, not because he was told to, but because it's kind. It's right. He's not seeing this person for what he is. He's seeing this person past one sixteenth of an inch. He is seeing this person not as an Israelite, and he's not thinking of himself as a Samaritan, but he says, this, my neighbor, is hurt, and my neighbor needs help. The problem is, we lose sight of this. We lose sight of all the racial undertones in this story. Jesus ain't got time for racism. Jesus wants you to do, wants us to do what we are supposed to do. And back to the lawyer's question, what is it we are supposed to do? Love God, love God your neighbor, your neighbor who was created in God's own image. That's it. That's what we do. That's why we do what we do. If you aren't doing that, you are not doing what Jesus specifically wants you to do, what you are pre-programmed to do, what God wants you to do. Close your eyes for a moment. Imagine a world of peace. I know it's hard, given everything that we see on the news and on the internet and all that, but just bear with me. Just pretend the world is a peaceful, loving place. A place where people feel as if they are accepted just because they are human beings. Where we sit back and love God, but love our neighbor as ourselves. You see, and that's what Jesus offers. That is exactly what Jesus offers his people. A world at peace. A world where we live as God intended. A family 
neighbors, caring for one another, lifting up one another when they are hurt, speaking out when they are being oppressed. This is what God wants for us. Love God. Love one another. If we can't do that, if we have a hard time loving our neighbor as ourselves, based on something they have literally no control over, I don't know if we can follow Jesus. I don't know if we can. When pressed by people, when asked issues of ethnicity and issues of race, Jesus always said, yeah, God loves them. In Christ, there's no Jew or Greek or slave or free or man or woman. There's a family, a loving family that God has created. It's no secret that this world needs that message now more than ever. Once again, we have allowed ourselves to become even more divided, even more fueled by rage, even more fueled by hatred, by the other, by those who don't look like us, who don't think like us, who don't talk like us, all of these things. We've allowed this to overtake all things. And it is time, my dear brothers and sisters, to stand up for the words of Christ. Not because it is easy, not because it fills us with a sense of moral superiority, but because it's kind. It's what's right. It is time to truly stand united with our brothers and sisters and to be a part of the reconciling work of Jesus Christ. It's time to look at those whom some people would call the other and ask them to finally truly, and once and for all, be our neighbor. Amen.